for joining us tonight on this um, um, first Wednesday night in November. And we're going to get into this tonight. You see by the uh, study guide that we have a lot, of, a lot of chapters to cover. I'm hitting the high spots. This is, uh, we're not kind of getting into a lot of the detail because uh, really it, it, what I'm trying to say to you is that if we can get the gist of these things, I want to come back with a video probably in the first of the year and uh, show some of the descriptive details of the things that we're talking about in the big picture uh, in our study of the book of Revelation. Let's have just a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, I do pray for your wisdom tonight. I pray that it would be showered down upon those who are hearing as, the, as well as the one who d demands it and uh, the one who expects it as the speaker tonight. Would you speak, Holy Spirit, because your servant needs to hear from you tonight in order to communicate this truth to those who have come to hear. We do pray that you will make it meaningful and purposeful. We do pray that you will also make it uh, personable to them, that they might be able to remember what is said here tonight and be able to share it with those who might ask them in the days to come. Because this is the issue, this is the crucial issue tonight in the, under our understanding of the future. We thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my professors at Columbia Bible College back in the, before the earth's crust hardened 100 years ago when I was there, um, made the statement one after his first year at Columbia, he asked the president, he said, Mr. President, could we install a zapper on the entrance to the Bible College campus uh, next fall so that all those new students who come in to Columbia Bible College, that was back when it was a Bible College down at univer uh, uh, International University, he said, so that all the students would be zapped of their, um, their religious views of the Bible, their humanistic views of Jesus Christ, their organizational views of the church, and just long enough, just long enough that, um, that we could kind of teach them the truth without having to tear down what they know, uh, spend waste time tearing down what they think they know, because we thought they came here to learn what they should know. But uh, I, I remember his uh, humorous request was not well received, but it was to illustrate how difficult it is to communicate biblical truth to those who have their minds made up about these essential doctrines of the Christian faith. Uh, in fact, when I was there in the late 70s and 80s, it was said that the professors spend the first two years and the students spend the first two years unlearning, put it on the student side, unlearning what they have been taught erroneously, perhaps with good intentions, but erroneously, so they can spend the last two years in learning what they need to learn um, correctly. And that's, that's, um, that charge could certainly be made regarding our understanding of the book of Revelation. Uh, late great planet Earth has a view. A lot of other books have a view. There are many other views out there. Some views think that all the things in the book of Revelation have already happened. Uh, and we're just uh, reading something that happened 2,000 years ago, even 5,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago. I take the futuristic view of this. I think the majority of evangelicals take the futuristic view. But if you've come from that view, then, then you understand uh, why tonight it's, it's going to be a little difficult. Because in my opinion, these things have yet to occur. We're in, we're in biblical prophecy here, not biblical history. We're reading material that was written 2,000 years ago by the Apostle John. And the Apostle John, uh, basically, it was just the pen and the quill, if you will, uh, of, of what's written here because he received this vision. It was given to him by Jesus Christ verbally, visibly. And yet he's describing events that will occur in the future. And so in some cases, John is describing these events in terms that he could understand in his day, but we're trying to discern what they mean in our day. Does that make any sense? So you have to have some sort of divine help here. That's the reason I cry out for the Holy Spirit to come be my interpreter and to do what Jesus said he would do, and that is to guide us into all truth. So I'm going to give you my best um, study on this, my best ed educated study on some of this. And I think it will all fit together if you'll see. Because we're going to be talking about tonight catastrophic events on this earth that God is going to use to judge those who rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior. And that will bring an end, and that, that He will also use to bring an end 
um, to this age and to the way we have known earth uh, all these many thousands of years. Now that cuts cross grain with a lot of Christian folks, a lot of religious folks, because they, they cannot see a loving God allowing things like this to happen. Well, you better need to gird up your lawns tonight because you're going to see some things that we just can't believe we can put over here under the category of God did this. I tried to get this across to you several weeks ago. If, if the sovereignty of God, if there is such a thing as a sovereignty of God, and there is, then it's both in the good and in the bad. You can't have the sovereignty of God only in the good things and not have the sovereignty of God in the bad things. And so he allows some things to happen to us. And most of the time, our greatest witness is when we're in the sovereignty of God in the bad things, because that's when we have to really trust him with all of our heart and body and soul and mind. Now, these events, we talked about the catastrophic, the catastrophic events. They're going to be followed by some glorious events in heaven that God has planned for those who receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and those of us who will live and reign with him forever and ever. And my prayer is that we don't get so caught up in trying to understand all of the signs that we miss the soon coming of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As Spurgeon wrote, and I would like for you to read that along with me, it's in the box in the study guide there, ready, go. It begins with the if now, ready? If now with eyes defiled and dim, we see the signs, but see not him. Oh, may his love the scales displace and bid us see him face to face. And that's the whole purpose. If you walk out of here tonight and you know this and that and the other about the events that's going to occur, when they're going to occur, how they're going to occur, how they're going to respond, et cetera, et cetera, but you don't know Christ, then you've missed the whole point of the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of the end time events. It contains that. It involves that. But the ultimate end of the book of Revelation is the final revelation of Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, the last few sermons have been about those events that will occur on the earth in the last half of the seven years of tribulation. The rise of the Antichrist, who will become the leader of the revised Roman Empire. The rise of the false prophet, who will become the leader of the revived Roman religion which I think has already been organized. We call it Roman Catholicism. Both will be human beings who will get their power from the great dragon himself, Satan, whose ultimate goal has always been and always will be to be equal with God and to do all he can to thwart God's plan for our redemption. Now, those two world leaders will form a coalition that will conquer the known world. They will establish a new world order, they will institute a new one world government and a one world religion that will eventually lead the people to worship the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan as God. Now you understand, those are the, that's the vision, that's the triangle through which we need to see everything that's going on in the world today. So let me go back with that a little bit. They will conquer the world, they will establish a new world order, they will institute a one world government, that will involve a one world religion. Now, having that vision, having that set of glasses on, do you understand why we're concerned about some of the things that we're seeing in the world today? Because they're leading up to this point. They're precursors, of course. They're not really, um, they're not really the, the, the birth pains that we're talking about. The birth pains, in my, in my understanding, do not start until after the rapture of the church. <clears throat> in the beginning of the tribulation, but we're seeing the precursors to some of those signs. If there were a little bit of earthquakes in Georgia several weeks ago, and there are massive earthquakes around the world, but there are coming greater earthquakes down the road, the likes of which this country, this world, this earth has never seen before. And so a lot of things could be put in that category <coughs> where we're going to see things happen uh, in small portions right here that will happen in greater portions down the road. So they will, um, these particular people will institute a system of individual accountability that will monitor those, the activity of everybody in the world, and expect those who do, do worship the, the beast and do not worship the beast and worship the Antichrist as God. That's called, they call it the beast, and I think it's going to be a computerized version of, um, of some sort of one world ruler. He will actually speak with a human voice. 
Now, those who do not participate in this worldwide system by taking the mark of the beast, whatever that mark might be, will not be allowed to buy or sell any type of commodity, including food. And those who, who help them or assist them by giving them food will have the same uh, results as those who violate the system by not taking the, the mark of the beast. But as we will see in the Sermon of the Ninth, eventually things will become so difficult with the catastrophic events occurring day after day across the earth. I mean, we're talking about massive things happening every day. The Antichrist will turn against the false prophet and his actions will bring the, to the earth to the point of total destruction. We've always thought that man would destroy himself. No, he won't. He, he, he won't, but he's going to reach the point of that, of total destruction. Countless thousands will receive Christ as their Savior and their Lord during this particular time. And most of them will be martyred for their expressed faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior and their worship of the one true God. Those are the elect, if you will, that will remain alive during the tribulation for a certain period of time. And they're called tribulation saints. This is where a lot of people get into trouble by saying, well, they're Christians in the, in the tribulation. Yes, they're believers, but they're not necessarily Christians. They're believers in Christ and will be with them for all of eternity. But Christ has his body of Christ that remains in the church age. So these are tribulation saints, looks like your Old Testament saints, right? So you have the Old Testament saints, the body of Christ in the New Testament, the Christians in the New Testament, and then you have the, the uh, tribulation saints, those who come to Christ during the last seven years. Now tonight we want to lift our eyes above the scorched earth for just a few minutes, and we want to back up into the heavens just for a few seconds here, where John will describe a few things that should give us all reason to have a hope for the future, especially in regards to the injustice that's going on in the world today. And let me just have a little sidebar here for moms and dads with children and teenagers and so forth. Um, yes, it's, it's tough today, but we, don't, we, can't, we can't give our children what they need to face the future by just concentrating on the fear of the future. We must equip them to face the future in faith and not in fear. Yes, that faith is going to become more necessary in the days to come than it was for Jimmy and Betty and others in that age group to live in their day. Um, yes, we had to have a lot of faith, but not near as much faith as our children and our grandchildren are going to have if time goes on in the future. So try not to scare your kids and your grandkids to death with some of this stuff, but use that as a warning that these days are coming, but we need to face them in faith and not in fear. I want to put it bluntly tonight, as I put on the study guide there today, um, sometime in, uh, in the day, we are asking, how long, Lord, are you going to put up with this injustice? Well, I want to tell you, payday's coming. Payday's coming, and that's what we want to see tonight. As we look at our world tonight, it may appear that the wicked are winning. And in many cases, they are winning some battles here and there. But they're not going to win the war, and they're not going to win the issue. God himself reserves the right of judgment upon every person. God himself. It's not my purpose to judge anybody. I don't have the, the right to condemn anybody. Uh, even Jesus said in John 3, 16, he didn't come into the world con to condemn everybody, but th that through him the world might be saved. And that's the way we need to take our approach to the future. God himself has the right of judgment. He's, he has yielded that right to Jesus Christ because he gave himself of the earth. And he will bring his judgment upon the people in his way, in his time. Our purpose is to pray for the redemption, their redemption before that day arrives. Because as we said last Sunday, they will be forced. They will be forced to say, Jesus Christ is Lord. But on that day, it will be one day too late. Because they will. only thing they can acknowledge is their failure to receive him as their Savior and their Lord. Now let me give you a quick um, version of tonight's outline and then we'll come back and put some more meat on the, on the skeleton there with you. John said he heard voices from heaven. We'll look at Revelation 14, 1 through 5. These are the 144,000 witnesses who will have already accomplished their work and will be taken into heaven. The Lord protected them down here. We'll talk about that in a moment. But then he took them up to heaven and they will form one massive choir. And, and Steve, I think they're looking for a director if you'd like to apply for that job. 144,000 voice choir will be singing those praises. Then there are the voices of judgment. 
Revelation 14, 6 through 20, six angels proclaimed the judgment of God upon those who worshiped the beast and participated in the mission of the Antichrist. Then there are voices of victory, Revelation 15, 1 through 4. These are the voices of the saints who refused the mark of the beast and were martyred for their expressed faith at the moment, but they were still rejoicing over victory. Uh, we think, oh, they lost their lives. No, they gave their lives rather than taking the mark of the beast. And then we'll see the voices of execution. I hate to close out on that, but Revelation 15, 5 through 16, 21, this is the voice of God that will issue the command for the seven angels to pour out the contents of their vials upon the earth, and it's going to be massive destruction. In Revelation 6, 9 to 11, the martyrs who are already in glory will ask God, how long, how long, how long are you going to allow your saints to endure the persecution of the wicked? And in these few verses of Scripture, God answers their cry for justice. Would you pick up reading with me tonight? Would you read along silently as I read along verbally? Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Revelation 14, 1 through 5. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard, by the way, go back to that a little bit, so you see the mark of the beast may be his name compared to what the name of the father. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the lambs. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Back up in Revelation chapter 7, before the seventh seal was opened, John said he saw God take a special group of Jewish men, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, seal them by the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses in the world during the final days, and the last days of the seven, days of seven years of tribulation. Well, as we now know, many things will happen in the world after those witnesses will be chosen not the least of which will be the rise of the Antichrist and his demand that everyone bow down and worship him. Well, these 144,000 will not do it. Here they are, all 144,000 of them, standing with the Lord Jesus on the Mount Zion as examples on display that God's seal of protection is sure and certain. In other words, if these 144,000 are going to continue to be his witnesses all throughout the world during these seven years, and he sees them in heaven, guess what? They made it. They made it, they were sealed from the, from the uh, activity of the Antichrist and Satan. They were sealed from all of that, and they made it through. Here they are. The fires would not burn them. The floods could not overcome them. The firing squads could not destroy them. Now, does anybody see any pictures of that in the Old Testament? Yes, Daniel in the fire. We see the flood, Noah and his family. We see all this when, when God seals us. We're protected. We're we're. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. The 144,000 Jewish witnesses will be God's untouchables, the old television program, constantly preaching the gospel throughout the earth until the day he calls them to heaven and to stand in his presence. Beloved, mark this down in your Bible. This is a picture of what it means to be sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of our full, final redemption. We are redeemed. We're as redeemed as we need to be, but he's left us here as his witnesses. But there will come a day when the redeemed of the Lord will be called up to be in his presence. And we are absolutely perfectly sealed. I kind of said this hurriedly in a, in, in a sermon Sunday, but I have a little joke about being hermetically sealed in a mayonnaise jar. We are sealed until the day of redemption. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, listen, we're not only set aside, that's one level of sanctification. We're sanctified for God's use, and we all better be doing what God has gifted us to do, or we'll have to give an account of that on the day of redemption. But we're also protected, we're also protected until we accomplish the work He has sent us to do. John 17, Jesus bowed before, even before He went to the cross, even before he went to the cross, and here's what he said, 
I have finished the work the Father has sent me to do. And, and how did he explain that? He said, I have given, I have shown you to these 11 men. I've shown you to those that you brought into my pathway. Wow. Did you think about that? He'd gone to, he hadn't gone to the cross yet. And we think Jesus Christ was sent to the world just to die. Well, yes, he was. But how can he say, I finished the work the Father sent me to do if he hadn't gone to the cross yet or hadn't been buried yet, hadn't been raised yet, hadn't been ascended yet? Well, answer the question. He said, I've given you, I've, I've given your word to those that you sent to me. Our salvation begins down here, the very moment we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord, but it will conclude in heaven where everyone who's been born again will reside forever. And beloved, every true believer is absolutely, totally immortal until God gets through with us. That means we don't have to fear the future. We don't have to fear obeying God. We don't have to fear going where he sends us. We're sealed until that day of redemption. And if you're saved today, you are as sure for heaven as if you were already there. Nothing can take you out of the Father's hand. John 10, 28, Jesus told his disciples, I give unto them those he saves. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. John 3, 16, <clears throat> for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that those who believe in him should not, next word, should not what? Perish. And he says, I, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall the, any man <clears throat> pluck them out of my father's hand. I'm not worried about the Antichrist. I'm not worried about all this other stuff. Why? I belong to Christ. I'm his and he's mine forever and ever. I want to ask you tonight, though, do you have such blessed assurance? Do you have that assurance? Now, that doesn't mean we go out and step in front of a freight train, do stupid things to test. No, no, don't tempt the Lord thy God. Send, was it uh, Black, what was his name, the gospel singer, when they told him to pick up snakes? He said, no, God's never told me to do that. He hasn't, and I'm not going to. You know, we don't do stupid things to test the Lord. We didn't bang one on the sunliners, is that right? And we don't do things to test the Lord, but yet at the same time, we don't hide ourselves from everything just because we're afraid of what might happen. <clears throat> but John said not only were the 144,000 witnesses standing, but they were singing. Because of the experiences they'd had during this time of tribulation, knowing that they were sealed, God's going to give them a song to sing that others cannot share. And they will have an orchestra of harps and other heavenly voices to back them up, to join with them in their chorus of praise unto the Lamb. Wow. I know that many in our small fellowship are going through some difficult times right now in your personal lives. I understand that. And, then the, and I have our own issues uh, with, with which we're having to deal. And the clouds of discouragement <coughs> and disappointment and what may appear as a defeat may have darkened your soul to the point that you cannot sing. But let me, don't, let me say this to you tonight. Do you realize that most of the songs in your hymn book are written out of such calamity, out of such heartache, out of such frustration, out of such disappointment, out of such discouragement, out of such defeat, out of such depression. Most of the songs that are in our hymn book tonight are written based upon this kind of sorrow. And, we, and yet we try to avoid every level of sorrow that comes along. Oh, we can't, hit, we can't go through that pain. Listen, sometimes God wants to teach us the greatest lessons in the midst of severe pain. My dear mother-in-law battled colon cancer. And she did everything she could to, to um, cure that cancer, everything that everybody would tell her to do, she would do. But when she would cry out on the pain, she said two words, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. She didn't say, oh, doctor, oh, pill, oh, something. She cried out, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. Would that be your case tonight? Would that be your cry tonight? Regardless of how severe our suffering is tonight, I urge you to hold on to the promise of God's word for joy will come in the morning. Weeping only lasts, say it, weeping only lasts when? For the night. And we're living in the night. We're living in the night right now. And no matter what you're going through, I promise you, hold on, hold on. Because tomorrow morning, whenever it comes, joy will come in the morning. One day God will take all of our sorrows and he will transform them into songs of his glory. But if we never go through sorrow 
Uh, as the songwriter said, if I never had a problem, I would never know that God could solve them. If we try to get out of every little issue that comes along and blame it on somebody else, then we'll never learn to trust the Lord in the midst of the, of the hard times. And yet, that's the very time that God wants to teach us the most about Him. And we we teaching our kids, though, to avoid every problem and heart. Let them go through it. Let them experience it. Let them test the, the power and the greatness of God in the midst of adversity first before we try to bail them out. Well, I'll be here hours if I don't get on. Voices of judgment. Look in cha Revelation chapter number 14, verse 6 through 20. Revelation 14, 6 through 20. <clears throat> <clears throat> then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image. These are the ones now that took, will take the mark of the beast. And whoever receives the mark of his name, that's right, I say it's not a number, it's the name, just like the name of God will be written across our forehead. I think the name of Satan will be written across theirs. And whoever receives the mark of his name, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. That's me, that's you, that's those who live in the tribulation time. Then, then, John said, I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle in the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out, of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great, great winepress of the wrath of God. You can see what's going on here. It's the, it's the squeezing out of those who are going to be true. And, 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 and the wine press was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridle for 1,600 furlongs. If you look on that sheet, did you get the inserts with the sheets? Do we get those in there? Okay, we, would you, do, you know where they are? Would you get those? Uh, it's the picture of, um, of the valley, okay? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Now, just as the future holds a great time of reward and blessing for the 144,000 Jewish witnesses, folks, listen to me, it also holds a great time of judgment for those who dare to blaspheme the name of God. Now, listen, to take the name of God in vain is more than just a curse word. It's taking the name and using it for some other purpose other than to recognize his holiness. So if I claim the name of God or the name of Jesus Christ, but yet I'm not living up to that name, I understand that I can't do that on my own. By the grace of God, I'll be there. But if I'm, if I'm claiming to be belong to God, but I'm not, that's blaspheming the name of God. It's blasphemy. Go back to verse 8. Babylon is fallen, fallen that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine 
of the wrath of her fornication. What does that mean? Well, in the Old Testament, Babylon was one of the great enemies of Israel, if not the greatest. Uh, people begin, the people of God begin to act like Babylonians. So what did God do? He sent them back to Babylon. You like Babylon? Go live in Babylon. Perhaps it was because of this that the name Babylon will be used in the last days to identify that corrupt political and religious system that will stand against God and terrorize God's people. And by the way, it will also come out of the Babylonian area. Babylon stands for the city of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will have his city as Christ will have his city, the city of God, the city of, of, of the Antichrist that will serve as the capital of the world during the tribulation. There are those today who say that the geographic location of that city will be the nation that we now know as Iraq. And I'm going to tell you, in talking with some of our members who have been there, uh, there are places where diamonds and emeralds and uh, other stones can be picked up on the ground, but, or off the ground, I should say, but you, you will never make your way out of that, out of that area. It's, it's free for the taking, but you've got to get out of there. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a, some of it's a beautiful place. But why, should, why such harsh judgment upon the new Babylon, the new world order? Why such harsh judgment upon the new religion? Look in verse 8. Babylon made all of the other nations drink of the wine of her fornication. In other words, the government of the Antichrist is going to force, entice at the beginning, but eventually force all of the other nations to join in his corruption. Or else they don't get oil, or they don't get wheat, or they don't get food, or they don't get water, or they don't get whatever. There will be the corruption of idolatry. as Citizens will be forced to give their first loyalty to the government rather than to God. We see that today. I can promise you there are folks who claim the name of Christ who write their tax check before they write their tithe check. Well, I have to give it to the government, but I don't have to give it to God. That's idolatry. You're putting the government before God, and you're expecting the government to take care of you more than you're expecting God to take care of you. Now, you need to work that out, and, and uh, you have to go back and and, and seek that out, but are, are, are you idolizing the government more than you idolize God? Then that's the precursor to the tribulation. There will be corruption of, of murder as the government will slaughter millions who refuse to bow down to the image of the beast or to place the new world order before God. Are we not seeing the government ordering murder today? How about the millions and millions of children? Oh, that's going to reduce inflation if we have more abortions. That was a statement coming from a candidate for the governor of Georgia. That you reduce inflation by increasing the number of abortions. How stupid, how silly, how absolutely evil can you be to say that, the, that the, the, a little baby who had no knowledge of his existence before two people decided to do that should be, the life of that person should be taken to, to prevent uh, a dollar to help those who are alive have another dollar. How do you explain that? How do you explain that to your children and your grandchildren? Folks, there's going to be corruption of sorcery as the leaders of the world were turned to astrology, witchcraft, and other kinds of demonic spirits for the direction and guidance. And I know some of you differ with me about my attitude towards Halloween. And that's all right. You can be wrong if you want to. But do not dabble with the devil. One more time. Do not dabble with the devil because he will always win. He will take you further than you want to go. He'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will always cost you more than you're willing to pay. Did you hear the stories about how many people were hurt and harmed and, and, uh, and, and were, were brutalized over the, over the uh, Halloween? No, you won't hear that. Because Halloween now is almost equal with Thanksgiving and Christmas in terms of the money spent for the holiday. There will be the corruption of fornication as sexual immorality will run wild, even more rampant than it is today. Can you imagine, ladies, living in a society, living in a time when there are no hesitancies, no, no uh, restrictions and no restraint to man's inhumanity to women? Let me just end it there. There will be the corruption of religion as eventually the Antichrist will establish himself as God and destroy all other religions. Well, isn't that what they're trying to do today? Aren't they trying to squelch out the name of God, those of us who believe 
in the authority of the scriptures, those of us who believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. Oh, you're just Bible thumpers. You're just hayseed uh, Bible thumpers. You're, just, you don't, you're among the unlearned. You don't know anything. However, in, John says in verse 9 through 11, God will destroy Babylon in due time. In fact, those are the verses that upset those people who don't understand that while God is the God of love, He's also a God of holiness, He's also a God of judgment. And for Him to remain holy, He must use His judgment in order to judge sin. And He will. If people continue to reject God's forgiveness and persist in their sins, they bring the judgment upon themselves. God doesn't send anybody to hell. They choose to go there. God doesn't send anybody, anyone to hell. They choose to go there by their willful rejection of the Savior. Go back to verse 14 through 20, which describe the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth to finish the battle of Armageddon. They, this will be the quickest defeat in the history of the world against the largest army ever amassed by any man. In verse 20, John said there will be so many killed in that battle that the blood will flow out of a stream 200 miles long and as high as a horse's bridle. All right, now, um, when we get the pictures tonight, and we will give them to you, you're going to see, you're going to see the, the Valley of Megiddo. And it's a perfect place for the, for the armies of the world to mass in one unit and all of a sudden go down that 10-mile-wide trek right into the heart of the city of Jerusalem. That's where the battle's going to be. Not in the city of Jerusalem. There's, some will make it there. But the majority of the ones that God's going to wipe out is going to be right there in the Valley of Megiddo. And when you look at this and you realize that's going to run 200 miles and almost seven feet deep, that is a lot of blood. I've stood up on that mountain where you're going to see the picture and you can see the little cars and trucks down there. And you realize that the, maybe the top of that hood of the truck might be five or six feet. And yet it's going to saturate that whole place. And that is a lot of blood. That is a lot of blood. One day, well today rather, God speaks the language of love and grace and mercy. Yet there are those who won't listen to it. They don't want to hear it because they don't want to surrender their life, life into his lordship. But on that day, he's going to speak in his wrath. And the final foot of his judgment will be released upon those who refuse to repent. And I don't, I'm going to show you some pictures of that tonight. But uh, it's unbelievable. The harvest of sin will be reaped and the vine of sin will be cut down and it will be burned. It will be over. Jesus Christ will be crowned the King of kings and Lord of lords. And my prayer is that those who are hearing this sermon tonight are, will be hanging from the true vine of the Lord Jesus and bearing fruit for his glory that will last for all of eternity. And that brings us to number three tonight, the voices of victory. Pick it reading me in verse 15, just the first four verses there. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. In them, these seven last plagues, the wrath of God is complete. Underscore that. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. He was describing heaven, which is indescribable. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on that sea of glass. So what he's seeing are, are the saved people in heaven and having harps of gold. That's where we've got all the gospel songs about um, sitting on a cloud and strumming a harp. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Great and marvelous is my Lord. Great and mighty you go. We sing that chorus. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. That is a, that is a song that they will sing uh, while he's looking up. And we'll hand these out, and I'll give you a chance just to look at them in a second here. John said he saw those believers from the tribulation who had overcome the beast and the system. Now, these are the people. This choir is made up of those who survived the tribulation and were raptured or taken, taken out of the world. Either they were martyred and resurrected or they were raptured before they were martyred. And since they were not able to buy or sell, they were totally dependent upon the Lord for their daily bread. And while some of them had been put into prison, Others had been slain. Each one 
had remained faithful to the Lord. So when we think about these people, when we think about these, some of these people, we need to understand that, yes, life is going to be tough. That's why I urge you, teach your children faith, not fear. Prepare them to live by faith, not in fear. You say, what do you mean? Well, it's okay that they have to wait for some things. If they don't receive Jesus Christ as their Savior before the rapture of the church, they're going to be involved in this. And your training for them may be that which equips them to survive in this time. They need to learn that, that beans don't grow in a can. That milk doesn't come in a carton. They need to learn the basic fundamentals of life. They can be intellectually smart but street dumb and not know how to survive in the world that's about to come. Like the children of Israel who sang at the Red Sea. These tribulation saints will be gathered there on that sea of glass. At least that's how John described it. These saints will sing by the sea of glass in heaven, and they will sing praises unto God for their deliverance through the tribulation. That's why they're called tribulation saints. My friend, it would save us a lot of sorrow if we would just accept the sovereignty of God in our lives and learn to trust him to know what is best for us each and every day. And the one scene that should give us sufficient courage to lift our heads up high tonight and walk on in faith, regardless of the suffering we may have to endure, is right here in this prophecy. Why? Because we're seeing the picture of those who survived the tribulation. They're tribulation saints, and they're in heaven, singing their heart out unto the Lord. Where are we? We're standing before the judgment seat of Christ. We're not finished yet. We're having to give an account of our lives, every moment of our lives, every idle word. But these tribulation saints are singing their hearts out before the Lord. Now, we'll come together as, as family in, later down the road in the kingdom of God and in eternity. But for right now, the tribulations, John's saying, I saw these. These are the ones who will survive and, and will go into heaven and sing. God is not only giving us a picture of what's to come, but the outcome of what is to come for those who trust him, but also for those who don't. If the tribulation saints will have the courage not to take the mark of the beast in that day, don't you think we ought to have the courage not to be conformed to the world in our day? Let me repeat that one more time. That was a real soft, that was a kind of a Presbyterian amen there. If the tribulation saints will have the courage not to take the mark of the beast in their day, should we not have the courage to not be conformed to the world in our day? Oh, I have to do this because I have to be accepted at the office. Oh, I have to do this or I won't be accepted in my little crowd, my little group. Oh, I have to do this or I have to fit in or my children have to participate. Really? The only thing you have to do is to trust the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not upon your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. You have to receive Christ as your Savior. That's it. But number four, look at the voices of execution before, I, before you execute me here. Revelation chapter 15, and we're going to read a little bit of scripture here, so gird up your loins. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. Ah, picture in the heaven. The heaven's doors are open. And out of the temple came seven angels having seven, I hate to say the word. What's your word in your Bible? Seven what? Plagues, plagues. Clothed, these angels were clothed in pure bright linen, having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. All right, now God is bringing, about to pour out his wrath, but he, he enlists these seven angels to do that. The temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were complete. So no matter where these tribulation saints were, no matter who we are, where we are standing before the judgment seat of Christ, we're not in heaven yet. We're in one part of heaven, but we're kind of on the outskirts of the temple of God. All right, look at the seven bowls. Number one, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. I, I don't want to do this, folks, but I've got it. It's the word of God. Number one. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore 
came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Next, the sea turns to blood. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. The waters turned to blood, number three. Then the third angel poured out this bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, You're righteous, O Lord, the one who is and the one who was and the one who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. Ah, here is the justice of God. Those of you who murdered the saints, martyred the saints before are going to, okay, you like blood, you want to see blood? Here's blood. And I heard another from the altar saying, even so, Lord, O God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then men are scorched. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. Can you imagine this? Even at this point, there's, wheat, there's, there's gnashing of teeth. You know what gnashing of teeth means? It holds your teeth together, and you try to talk to your tongue, and you, you, know, you just, you know. That's gnashing of teeth. Darkness and pain. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Here they are. The, the, the fish are gone. The fresh water is gone. They got these sores like Job. You know, they got all this, and it's just they fill with pain. The sun, there's no, there's no shade anywhere. And rather than crying out unto God, well, they're angry at God. Then all of a sudden the Euphrates begins to dry up. And by the way, it's beginning to dry up now. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. That's on one of your maps there on your sheet. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, like frogs, not were frogs, but like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. I'm going to tell you what I think that says. The three unclean spirits are going to try to go out, as you see on your map, and gather all these nations from the east and the west and the north and the south, and they're all going to come and assemble there in the valley of Megiddo. And it's going to be the great day of God Almighty. They're coming to think that they're going to get oil, they're going to get water, they're going to get grain, they're going to get something that Israel has that nobody else has. Notice what he says, Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together in the place called in Hebrew Armageddon, the valley of Megiddo. And then the earth is utterly shaken. Okay, let's picture now all the armies of the north, east, south, and west, Arab nations, western nations, eastern nations, and so forth, and the, all the nations of the east have to come across the Euphrates River, and that's why it begins to dry up. So the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air over this army, these armies, and the loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, so remember the loud voice? That's the voice of God. That's when your father speaks. It's over. It's done. And there were noises and thunder and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, <clears throat> such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. One Bible commentator said, if you took up the magnitude of every earthquake that has ever occurred, this earthquake would be equal then to all of them put together. It is so large that the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now watch this. How great was the earthquake? Every, are you reading with me there? Every island fled away. The mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon the men. Each hailstone weighed about a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail since the plague was exceedingly great. Folks, the day is coming when a holy and righteous God will take a final step 
to end human history as we know it. And this is the great day of the Lord. And it all starts right there in the valley of Megiddo on your map. It's described here as a seventh trumpet, which is the announcement of a series of events that will occur on the earth and carry out God's final judgment. Let me repeat this just one more time. A time will come when he will respond to the cry of the martyred saints. How long? How long? A time will come when he can no longer tolerate the denials, the cursing, the immorality, the sorcery, the fornication, all the false religions, all the phony baloney that's going on in the church today. So when the seventh trumpet blast is blown, the seven vials or seven bowls of God's judgment will be poured out on the earth to bring an end to human history as we have known it for at least maybe 10,000 years. Notice several things about the judgment. The judgment is not going to come from any man. The judgment is going to come from the most holy place, which means it will come from the very presence of God himself in the temple of the holies. For he is the only one who has the right to judge the world. We can say this one ought to get that one, that one ought to get this, but only God has the right to judge. We don't. And the judgment will fall upon man so quickly there will be no place to hide. In fact, the Bible says there, or some commentaries on this says, there will be such confusion that the men will actually shoot and kill each other because they think they're fighting the enemy when they're really fighting themselves. The door of the temple will be finally closed. No one will be able to enter heaven until the judgments are over and complete. The day of grace will be over. Whew. The day of warning will be over. Wow. The day of pleading will be over. What a terrifying thought. The voice from heaven will not be, please repent of your sins. The voice is, it's done. It's over. The day will soon come when God will close the door of his grace just as he closed the door of the ark and the justifiable wrath of God will be poured out upon the earth. Go back to verse 12 for just a moment. John said, when the sixth angel poured out his wrath upon the Euphrates River, it began to dry up. Why? Again, so the armies of the east, the Arab nations, as well as China. China, by the way, is the only nation that has now can boast of a 200 million man army. 200 million man army. And they can cross over the Euphrates into Israel and assemble there with the other armies from the north. In other words, Russia. I think I put that on your map. <coughs> the armies <coughs> from the south, Africa. The armies from the west. Uh, you say, where's America in this? Well, we have uh, yielded ourselves to some sort of Western alliance of nations included in that 10-nation European confederation, which is why you have the globalists, what they're trying to do today is to bring America down to where it's no better, no worse than any other nation on earth, and so we just become just one of others. They'll assemble in the Valley of Megiddo to come against Jerusalem, the evil spirits, will have convinced them that they're fighting for oil or for some other human need that they can get from Israel. Megiddo is really a beautiful valley. Been there several times in northern Israel. It's about 200 miles long, about 10 miles wide. It runs all the way from the Mediterranean Sea all the way to the Jordan Valley. Uh, a perfect pathway, again, as I say, to the city of Jerusalem. And they think they can just assemble there. If you can look at that big picture from the top of the mountain, they can assemble there and then go right down that 10 mile stretch into the city of Jerusalem. But once the armies are assembled and they begin to march to Jerusalem, in verse 17, John said the seventh angel will pour out his bowl of wrath in the air. What does that mean? Well, he describes it as thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes and a great earthquake such as not once since the beginning of man on the earth, a worldwide earthquake so strong, the mountains will crumble and the islands will disappear into the sea. The whole topography of the earth will change. Hailstones weighing a talent that's about 100 pounds will fall from the skies. And yet, and yet, and yet, rather than repenting and crying out unto God, the people will blaspheme God even more. The Bible calls us the great day of God Almighty when all the nations of the earth will gather for that final battle, Armageddon, you've heard it over and over again, and the Lord Jesus will return to destroy them with the word of his mouth and the glory of his presence. And you'll see behind the horse, those of us will be coming to this earth with him to rule and to reign with him on this earth for a thousand years. And it is in that very valley that John said the blood will rise to the level of a horse's bridle. Can you picture that? Can you picture, withstand your, go to the map, go to the picture, I think it's the front page. 
where you stand, you're standing on the top of the, of, of, of the mountain of Megiddo, and you're looking down into the valley. Notice the little highway down there, okay? A truck running on that highway. Let's just say the hood ornament's about five, maybe five and a half feet. And he says the blood's going to run seven feet high, up to the horse's bridle. That's a lot of blood. When that happens, the age of grace is over. Time and history will be no more. Godliness and righteousness will be brought to the earth in the person of Jesus Christ. And we will dwell with him on this very earth for a thousand years and in the new heaven and the new earth forever, world without end. Why? Because the curse will be lifted and uh, the grace of God will remove the curse far as that curse is found. As we'll sing here in a few more weeks when we sing joy to the world, the Lord has come. All right. That's uh, Revelation chapter 14 through 16. And we'll come back and finish it up a little bit later. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your words. Not even a word that we want to hear, but yet it's just as valid as John 3.16. It's just as valid as any other text. It's just the truth. That's all we can say. It's truth, truth, truth all the way through. We do thank you for the extra measure of your wisdom tonight, the extra measure of your understanding, the extra measure of your discernment. The Bible says, the book of James, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally, but let him ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the sea tossed to and fro by the wind. But Lord, help us not now just to stick these notes in our Bible and say, well, okay, I've been there. Let me check that off. I heard this. Now I understand. No, no, no. Lord, help us to understand this is, the, this is the message you've given to us tonight to tell others. Because I can promise you that even those Many with whom we might sit on the pew and the, and the chairs each Sunday do not know this truth. They don't think it's going to happen. They've been misled to believe that it's all already happened or it's not going to happen. Or if it does, it won't happen in their lifetime. Father, would you forgive us for holding on to these truths that can be life-changing to those who don't so desperately need to hear them. We thank you now for those faithful ones every Wednesday night who've been here. We thank you for those who've listened by any other means on our website or now through the YouTube channel. We thank you for that. We had no idea that people would be this interested in it, but we thank you that you've given us the privilege to be a part of what you're doing in their life. And we do it for your glory and for your honor, and for your praise alone. But we ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.